Hi, my name is Jeffrey Gibson. I'm an artist living in the Hudson Valley in New York, and I'm here for the opening of Like a Hammer, my um, mid-career survey exhibition here at the Seattle Art Museum. The words come from the 1996 song um, by Nas featuring Lauryn Hill, If I Ruled the World. And a uh, period of time when I was, let me see, in 1996, I was 24 years old and listening to a lot of hip hop, being in art school, working at the Field Museum, thinking a lot about identity politics, a lot of questions for me personally about what it meant to be Native American, to be pursuing an art career, and working with um, a number of different kind of aesthetics and histories and trying to merge them together. So the bags themselves are really about, um, I wouldn't say conflict, but about struggles and power, um, which is what brings a lot of people to boxing initially. It's also very therapeutic to kind of try to name your anger um, and to try to place it and then also to kind of attack it or resolve it somehow. And that's what brought me to working with punching bags initially. And so um, this pattern um, that you see here and you also see it on my arm, this kind of repeat of a triangle and trying to figure out how to continue and you'll see it in a number of the bags, but how to continue working with that pattern but also transform it through color. And in this case, turning the triangles also into a pattern. I wanted the text to be really, really bold. Um, the text is always in all caps, and it does have a kind of reference to um, like a kind of commercial type of scrolling LED um, or LCD um, text. And then, of course, the fringe and the jingles on the bottom, which you'll see on a number of the bags. Um, those would come and do come from a vendor who serves the powwow circuit. In fact, almost all of the materials that I use do. So the beads are crow beads, um, also from a vendor from the Powell Circuit. They're glass. Um, the bags are uh, commercially produced, and then the covering is made to go on top of them. Um, and then the jingles originally would have been the lids of tobacco and snuff containers um, that were traded and then were turned and used to adorn dresses. Um, and so now you would find them in jingle dress dancers, uh, out garments, and regalia. Um, and these that I use here, which, which are made to serve the powwow public, um, they're produced in Taiwan. They're produced by the probably millions. Um, they're patented. And I really um, respond to them for a number of reasons. One, because I think it's, it's amazing that a culture can take a material like the lid of a tobacco container and then turn it into something that serves their own needs. But also now that they're produced, they really are representative of a very niche specific market, that there's no real other purpose for a jingle. And I think that that also sends a signal that, that Native communities are active and alive. They have their own economy of some sort and um, there's a market. I, I would say the bags throughout the course of the 40 plus bags that have been produced really track um, I suppose an evolving of myself. And it does kind of follow um, really different indigenous histories of going from being an object made for use to being an object for appreciation. But um, then of course when there's a market, then the artisans begin to kind of want to, um, I guess impress and like how many colors can you use and how tight can your weave be and how small can your beads get. So as I've learned more, and I have a studio that I work with, my studio team, um, I would say we're pretty, we've started recently trying to experiment with some things with these materials to push it even further. But we're at that point where it's like, as far as uh, the beadwork and the text, I don't, there's really no limit to what we can actually do right now.